Okay, so I'll just do my usual big gob. Um, okay, so I was going to start off with this man needs no introduction and then promptly introduce him. Um, so those of you that know and have had the privilege of listening to Luke before, don't need him introduced, but this is Dr. Luke Bearden. Some of you may know him from our resources and our library, but not have actually met him before. So this is a rare privilege and thank you very much, Luke. Um, so yeah, no, uh, in t thank you, Linda. Yes, sorry, socially appropriate things and all that sort of stuff. Yes, thank you, amazing Linda, one of the best humans. Um, you can keep that in the recording if you like, Dream. Uh, well, this is about autistic safety and I've called it an Axia production because it's solely for Axia. So this is a one-off uh, presentation, never to be repeated. And I've got my own rules, which are really tiny by the looks of uh, Everything shared in this session uh, is strictly confidential, shouldn't be shared with anyone without their permission. So if you do want to share something, just ask. Um, inclusivity in general, uh, please respect everyone in the session, aim to be as inclusive as possible. In terms of individual inclusivity, feel free to fidget, uh, jump, stim, knit. I had a student who uh, completed loads of knitting while I was teaching. Uh, she said, it's great, I get, uh, I get to learn from you and complete my knitting at the same time. Uh, whatever suits you, as so long as it doesn't cause distress to anyone else. Um, and I know it's a bit late in the day because I've already started, but if anybody needs me to adapt in some way, shape or form, um, let me know. <laughs> it's a bit too late, but there you go. Um, yeah, or uh, ask Axia, that's what I've put. So I should have sent this message out probably last week, so apologies for that. In terms of questions, feel free to ask questions uh, as I chat, including the lovely people on Zoom. I don't know if you're lovely or not. Um, just making assumptions there. Uh, but yeah, so I think somebody's monitoring Zoom and they can uh, shout at me if there's a question on Zoom that needs answering. Uh, this is, uh, I have to put that on for reasons that we won't go into. Um, in terms of a little trigger warning, and I have put this on um, other slides as well, um, or other presentations. So it's my hypothesis, it is only a hypothesis, so uh, it's not rooted necessarily in evidence, although there is growing evidence to suggest that the hypothesis is a valid one. Um, but my belief is that there's a pervasive and invidious pattern of thought, behaviour and belief that's at the heart of a societal norm, I'll, cut, I'll try and explain it, that is in effect destroying autistic lives. Um, and some of you may know that from your own experience, or know other people who have kind of suffered that fate. Um, on a positive side, I think it can be avoided um, relatively easily, little cost, um, with extraordinary reward. So when I'm talking about this kind of, it's, it's kind of unconscious bias. So when people talk about, um, you know, kind of like institutionalized race, institutionalized anti-autism within society, but I think that is at a subconscious level. I don't think people are horrible deliberately, but I think that there's this permeation of negativity and treatment of autistic people almost automatically as lesser that has the same impact as that sort of parallel with institutionalised racism. Yeah. So, in terms of autistic safety, I'm not talking about things like consent and abuse and those that sort of safety. I'm talking more of a kind of... Um, conceptual level. So I hope to share some thoughts about what it might mean to feel safe as an autistic person. What does it, because I don't think we think about it, well I, I'm not, sorry I shouldn't say we, um, I don't think, certainly people that I know, autistic people, um, think about safety at all sometimes. I mean, I could challenge you, I'm not going to, I'm not going to put you on the spot to go, hands up, how many of you wake up every morning thinking about your own autistic safety in terms of feeling safe in any given environment? But we should. We should all be allowed, in inverted commas, to feel safe in our own world, within society. And I don't think we do. I, and you please, please, please correct me if I'm wrong. I hope I am wrong, actually. It would be amazing. If you all go, well, we all feel perfectly safe, thank you. I'll leave and leave you to it. Um, but I don't think that's the case. People even necessarily feel that they have the right to feel safe. But you do. And we need to be fighting individually, I think, and collectively within, if you like, the autism tribe, or the autistic community and in a broader um, way in terms of professional services, 
parents, friends, partners, all of those sorts of things, to fight for the right to be autistically safe. Because until we've got that right, and that right has turned into a reality, there's still work to do. And I'm, I'm unsure in terms of where all of this is coming from. Like, this is the first presentation I've ever done on autistic safety. I'm unaware of any presentation, certainly that, I'm, that I've been at conferences where people have talked about autistic safety. And I think it needs to be part of the, the autism narrative, if you like, to get people to understand just how unsafe it feels to be autistic on a day-to-day -day basis in normal society. And I think there are analogies with, for example, ethnic minorities and all those sorts of things which are coming to the fore. And there's been so much quite dramatic, in some cases, paradynamic shifts in societal attitudes towards mental health, for example, gender inequality, ethnicity. We, we've got a long way to go. But there has been quite a lot of change, societal change. But it ain't happening in the autism world. And I don't know why. I, ge I genuinely don't know why, but I think it, it's got to change, it has to change. I mean, we probably need more famous autistic people or something, I don't know, but um, I do think it needs to be part of the ongoing narrative so that when you've got a child with an EHCP, the very first thing that people are saying is, does this child feel safe? If not, what are we doing about it? Um, when you're when you are your first port of con port point of contact with Axia or with G the GP or with any professional when you make that incredibly brave decision to inform this person or organisation that you're autistic, that your expectation is straight away that they'll come back and say, what can I do to make you feel safe? And yet that doesn't happen. Well, I'm sure it happens at Axia, but it, that, that imagine that if that was the first response you always got when you made that brave disclosure to a human being or a member of society, was always, okay, what does that mean to you? What can I do to make you feel safe? How but anyway, normal people or non-autistic people, non-neurodivergent individuals, um, I just call predominant neurotype, as in, not necessarily in this room, but within the general population, it's a demographic norm. So it's, it's a statistical thing rather than any, m making any kind of judgment. And I don't like the word typical because it's too similar to normal, as, which is too similar to the opposite, which is abnormal, which has negative connotations. So that's why I use the term predominant neurotype. Um, absolute rejection of the term disorder. Um, bone of contention with me and Axia ASD, but never mind. Um, and I know they don't, they, they don't approve, and I know there's all sorts of legal reasons. Um, I don't like ASC either, as in condition. You're not a condition, you're a human being. Just, I'm sure you know that. You don't have a condition either, you are autistic. Well, that's my view. You might feel differently, which is absolutely valid as well. But that's just from my point of view. Um, and I use identity first, so autistic rather than a person with autism. I don't think it's an add-on, it's an intrinsic part of you as a human being. Um, and I don't think we should be trying to change that. I think we should be trying to change all sorts of things that surround that, like anxiety and all of those sorts of things. But I'm absolutely 100% convinced that autism does not equate to anything apart from being autistic. So when people say, oh, if you're autistic, that must mean x y and z you can say not necessarily it means i'm autistic that's it so when people i know people have been rejected from cams for example say we can't do anything about anxiety it's because you're autistic no it's not being autistic does not equate to being anxious otherwise every single person autistic person would be anxious and that's not the case it's environmental factors alongside you as a human being that cause the anxiety so it's my equation, which I think this is the first presentation I've ever done where I've not included it, but I'm going to say it anyway. Awesome plus environment equals outcome. So if that outcome is anxiety and you agree with that uh, equation, you don't have to, but you should because it's right, um, and we acknowledge that you can't change being autistic, which you can't, then the only thing left to change is the environment. So we spend, a we, society spends an enormous amount of resource and by resource, I mean time, energy, money, into changing autistic people, trying to change autistic people. Um, 
which <laughs> which doesn't work you don't you can't make anybody less autistic you can make them appear less autistic if you really want um which is a very cruel i was gonna say cruel and unusual i wish it was unusual um it's a very cruel way of going about things but if you I, in my view if you want to change the outcome you have to change the environment not the individual themselves um, that's just what i feel I've got a, a total rejection of functioning labels or notions of severity. I was talking to Linda earlier about, you know, when people say, oh, I'm a little bit X, Y, Z. It's like, no, you're not. You're either autistic or you're not, in, in my view, anyway. And I, I, I can't bear this uh, almost kind of like, well, I'm more autistic than you because you know, child is whatever. You are either autistic or not. Um, I, I absolutely reject functioning labels. You're high functioning, you're medium functioning, you're low for whatever very very odd way of looking at things without taking the environment into account so uh, i quite like this i, I love language uh, so uh, pnt stability versus autistic fragility it's got a nice sound to it although the concept behind of it is a bit bleak um, but i just want to go through by the way this is a very short presentation in a sense um all these things so i i sometimes talk about this uh, concept of stability and resistance to change so again i think actually this is just one example of perhaps a myriad of examples that you could give around should we say awesome theory or perceptions of autism which i think is flawed so maybe you've been to training events more recently than me but we we are still taught you still see it in the awesome narrative or rhetoric Autistic people are resistant to change. Um, and I think these sorts of things don't provide either stability for the PNT or instability for the autistic person, which then leads to feelings of unsafe or, or feeling unsafe. Um, and I'm going to go through these individually. So if life, just, just, just work with the hypothesis for the moment if your life is unstable because a lot of the things that the rest of society find comforting and stable and easy and in fact don't even think about them whereas you're having to think about them all the time because you don't fit in with that way of being then your levels of instability are going to far outweigh those of the PNT so it might surprise you I don't know most PNT don't feel unstable or unsafe most of the time. If you say to a PNT person, when was the last time you were physically aware that you were stressed? They might say, oh, that was last year when I went for a job interview. Not, well, when I woke up this morning, which is usually autistic. The clismic difference, disparity between the lived experience for, of the, if you like, average PNT compared to, if you like, the average autistic person. And I think it's a lot to do with that chaos that is the PNT world, that for the PNT is not chaotic at all. It's easy. It's, it's, you don't even have to consciously work things out. It's just there. Whereas the autistic person is working things out constantly and not conclusions because the rules aren't made by them. And they're not explicit anyway. Now, everybody needs stability. So what do we do? And, and stability equates to safety. And it can happen, by the way. Absolutely. You can feel stable and you can feel... It's easy to do, but it can happen. Uh, in part through your own efforts. Unfortunately, you do have to rely on lots of other people as well, which is why, I, going back to what I was saying earlier on, why we need this concept of autistic safety to be high up on the agenda of the autism narrative. Um, so in terms of communication, so these are things you can take, you literally can take this as a blueprint if you want. You can have the slides and go and take them back into work or whatever. So, right, or, or just, you know, put it in the local newspaper. If as soon as you say, okay, well, I might, you don't even necessarily need to say you're autistic. Say, so look, I might prefer different forms of communication rather than verbal. Why, again, rhetorical question, why can't we just be offered this from the outset? literally at first port of call say okay do you like written forms of communication or would you prefer verbal would you prefer me to do a screencast rather than sending you a set of written instructions it's quicker to do a screencast than it is a set of written instructions so why am i not offering that to you which i do offer to you by the way if you're one of my students 
are you would you are you would you prefer non-verbal communication do you like to use emojis as opposed you know in terms of um when i'm writing you a message so that it's crystal clear what i'm actually saying the unwritten rules um what about social media are you a fan of social media do you want me to direct message you as opposed to phoning you out of the blue if i am going to phone you would you prefer a text message first? would you prefer me to phone somebody else to pre-warn that the fact that if i'm going to come around and see you do you want me to knock on the door or does that make you absolutely yourself but there you go so but if you have these that are given to you from the outset straight away you're like oh my god i think i might trust you i think i might have some faith that you're going to provide me with some element of safety in my dealings with you because you've acknowledged that not everybody does things in the same way you've acknowledged that not everybody does things in your way and they and you might need to make some adjustments for me and that's gorgeous again rhetorical question but how often are we actually faced with that reaction animal communication we've got to understand that animal communication is absolute or can be absolutely lush and it should be up there in terms of just everyday communication, in terms of autistic people um and then i think we need to get to a point where it's socially acceptable or it's the social norm to cut off communication when it suits you and it's beginning to be the case i've got work colleagues who will um you know qu quite clearly say if i've got my headphones on at work don't communicate with me don't come up and talk to me if i take my headphones off in this horrendous open plan office um then you can come and engage with me that's got to be the norm now all of these sound like tiny little things and they are in a sense but all of those tiny little things added up together leads to stability, which leads to safety. And so far, not cost Um Okay, it's specified times for communication are, are good as well. It's like, so, so say for example, this is just one example that I would say in professional work, I'm a lecturer by the way, I think I forgot to say that. So I teach, that's, I'm a university lecturer. Um, so if I've got an autistic student for whom their life is on hold when they submit a piece of work that they want feedback on, which is the case for some people who are very anxious, I'll say, well, we'll plan ahead. If you agree that in two weeks' time at three o'clock in the afternoon you submit that piece of work, I guarantee I'll have it back for you by four o'clock on that same day as opposed to you need to wait for a week like every you know that it takes me exactly the same amount of time to provide feedback whether i do it that day or the following week but it makes all the difference to you in terms of that pre-empted communication in terms of when I, when I get my feedback or i can say when you submit this piece of work you won't get feedback for three weeks because it has to go through a moderation so don't expect anything at all and i will tell you exactly when i release those marks okay so um in terms of sensory safety this could be a whole day really um but again when was the again rhetorical question when was the last time when you engage in an environment and immediately it's your sensory needs and 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 give me what those sensory needs might be and then i can go into the physical environment to do an audit to work out whether or not it fits your sensory needs and whether i can make any adaptations or changes in order to make you feel safer um sometimes little things like oh can I make sure I'm the last in the room and the first out and can I make sure I'm sat by the door so that I've got that escape route should I need should I need it can I sit at the back so nobody's looking at me can I sit at the front so I don't have to look at everybody else L whatever it, and I'm talking about that in terms of teaching within a university sometimes those are the things you know going in and saying oh, that seat is reserved and there's the aisle I'm not particularly pointing at you by the way um so you can sit next because if you find proximity to people problematic the other thing about sensory environment is do you again rhetorical question but do you know your own sensory profile and it please if you don't investigate it because it's potentially life-changing um i know so many autistic adults who don't know that how they process the sensory environment differs considerably to other people within that same environment they just make the assumption that everybody is experiencing it in the same way but they're just putting up with it so much better than than she is sure. i wrote about this in one of my books 
um, like you've got an interview panel, rather than you asking questions alternately, you ask all your questions, then the next person. Something as simple as that can make the difference between a person totally losing their thread and think, I can't cope with all this different input to getting a job. And it costs nothing apart from a tiny bit of awesome knowledge and understanding. Now, we sh I don't know. You've probably got <laughs> way better ideas than me. I don't know how to get this as part of the everyday agenda, but it's absolutely game-changing. Going back to what I was saying earlier about destroying autistic lives, we know autistic people, their age range expectancy is way lower than it should be. We know simple things like Autistic adults don't go to the GP, which kills them because the GP's only communication system is to phone up for an appointment. If I can't use the phone or it stresses me out far more than, you know, the, I'm stressed anyway because I don't feel very well, oh, I'm not going to bother using the phone. And then I don't access the, I, I literally don't have access to primary health simply because you can't let me email the GP surgery and request an appointment for eight o'clock in the morning where I know I can walk in without going, using the waiting room. Costs nothing, literally nothing. And that would save somebody's life, literally. And we're not doing it. Drives me mad. Anyway, um, yeah, by the way, can we just eradicate waiting rooms as well? So, there's some <laughs> we'll be able to work out a way of just not having waiting rooms, especially in GP where everybody's ill. Similarly, um, alexithemia and emotions and again how often are we given the opportunity to work out whether we understand emotional terminology and emotional states so absolutely this concept that autistic people lack feeling I've seen I've heard people say oh yeah autistic people are very emotionless what they mean is I hope, I hope they really mean that. I guess what they mean is sometimes an autistic person might not express an emotional state or they might react emotionally differently compared to other people. Usually very logically, but still at an emotional level. So autistic people, it's not that, um, just because you might not be able to articulate how you're feeling doesn't mean that you're not feeling. Um, and also, again, how do you know what you don't know? How do you, if, if somebody says, oh, you know, What's your, what's your emotional state? And you don't, you don't have the terminology because nobody's actually taught you what being happy means or what being sad means. It's like, it's like you go to the doctor, talking about going to the doctor again, it's like on a scale of one to 10, how painful, how much pain are you in? So many autistic people would say, well, oh, one, you know, and they're like in excruciating pain only because they've got brilliant imaginations and thinking, well, I am in pain. Uh, having my fingernails ripped out while simultaneously blah 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 I'm okay thanks um, as opposed to the doctor saying are you consciously aware that you're in pain is the pain bad enough so that it stops you sleeping is the pain bad enough that it wakes you up at night if so how often which is a far more sensible way of ascertaining your level of pain uh, okay. Socialities, so autistic friendships. So the, again, you kind of you'll know all of this anyway. But it's got to be the norm that um, that that your best friend is your whatever dog, swan, goose. Anyway, um, so or, uh, animals really, really do count, and they should count absolutely. Um, it's uh, so often on Twitter you'll see an autistic person saying oh my pet's died or whatever and it's so overwhelming the amount of love that they get from other autistic people going on I absolutely understand whereas and I, I'm not having to go at PNT people but I do think there's an underestimation of just how much that means to, to many people but particularly autistic people as well. Um, solitary sociality can be pretty cool it's perfectly okay to enjoy time on your own that isn't to say that we should allow autistic loneliness that's a completely different thing so just because some if a person is on their own and they want to be that's a huge problem um allowing oneself to be autistic and reduction of masking could benefit in many cases so we know about masking we know about camouflaging and we know we do know there's great evidence to directly link as direct Masking and trauma as a of masking. So we know that that constant, you've got to be this, you've got to be this, you've got to be this, you've got to pretend to be somebody else, can lead to long-term trauma. What really worries me, 
and this ha I've seen this happen time and time again um, often well anyway ironically often when people come to terms with the fact that they are autistic and it's like oh my god I've camouflaged all my life I'm gonna be my authentic self and that ironically enough is when their world crashes because people around them are going, well, you're not really like that. You didn't used to be like that. Why have you to blah, blah, blah. As opposed to that's the genuine you. And previously you've been masking. And it's this, I find, quite odd reaction. Why would you try and be something that you're not when you finally realise who you are as an authentic individual? Yeah. Do you often find that when people get to that point, they don't know who they are anymore? They don't know Some people, yeah. I know uh, yeah, hundred percent. I I have people still in my life who contact me and say, "Well, you know me better than I am. Can you just remind me who I am?" Um, and that's well, Linda would know better than me. That's quite a dangerous place to be. Um, I know people who go to work and then come back, and it takes them, you know, literally hours to turn back into themselves because they've been masking so, you know, so much when they're out. And I just think there's nothing bad to mask. This is what really upsets me. It's like, you, autistic people are not harmful individuals, generally speaking. Being authentic and autistic is fine, or it should be, just because you might behave in a different way or stim or whatever, um, that, or, or having to watch what you say constantly. Um, I think we've got to be more accepted. I think that's why I love the concept of autistic normality. Autistic passionate interests are a must. Stop denying people their passionate interests. Stop calling them obsessions, which is negative. They're the same thing, you know, embrace them. I can name drop. I was doing uh, filming with Chris Packham the other day. Um, don't ask me when it's coming out because everybody says, oh, when's that BBC documentary that you're in coming out? So, I don't know, I didn't ask. I did my filming bit and then that's all I have to do. <laughs> And he was saying, you know, at school, I, I hated certain subjects, no good at them. But then other subjects, I absolutely got, found gorgeous. Just let me do that all the time. He was allowed to do that all the time. And that led to his... It's not as simple as that for all autistic people. But I think the flip side, far too many autistic people are not allowed their passionate interests because of this very rigid traditional role of education that we have. Um, and it doesn't work. And it's similar, I have to say in employment it's like in employment in so many jobs you have to be vaguely good at a whole bunch of stuff most of which is not relevant and strengths in terms of our spiky profiles is clearly the way forward and yet i have to say generally speaking within society um everything almost everything is set up in the opposite way where sort of that sort of mediocre you're kind of a little bit good at a whole bunch of stuff as opposed to being really really good uh, you get away with it if you're a professor of pure maths at cambridge or if you're a brilliant brain surgeon or something like that you get away with it, get away with it. um i think that should be more commonplace to, to lesser degrees right across the board so that we have the autistic employee who is really really good at that and they do that 12 hours a day and then you've got the rest of the population who do all of the other bits and bobs it works brilliantly when you have that amalgamation i think and then everybody feels safe especially and in, you know, particularly the autistic person yeah. i think um, it's only fair to say that um we need to be we need to have a critical eye when it comes to i've put awesome theory here and theory of mind in particular, but just understanding of autism, I, I, it really, really, really worries me um, when you go on the internet and look up like what is autism um, or something similar on, uh, along those lines. And I've had students do uh, research projects around, say, for example, media portrayal of autism or um, it, or newspaper articles or, or whatever it might be and it is deeply disturbing some of the rhetoric and some of the narrative some of the pejorative language that's used almost consistently around what being autistic actually means etc 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 so there's a huge amount of work to be done that could be done literally overnight you know if we all decided as a society to get rid of any pejorative language in relation to autism for example then ch autistic children will grow up not being told they're disordered and have a bunch of deficits so this kind of model of you are a lesser human being literally i think could be eradicated overnight um this is a, linda asked if i was going to do this name drop i might as well but um i'm down to 
uh, go to Geneva to address the United Nations and the World Health Organization in February to basically demand that in terms of a neurodiversity charter. Um, I don't suppose they'll listen, but anyway, we'll give it a go. I'll shout really loudly at them. Um, so the, if we're going to say autistic people lack a theory of mind, for example, and that's what we're told, isn't it? It's like, and, and you know, if you go back, I'm not, I won't delve into it, but if you go into the history of what theory of mind and what some of those researchers actually said about theory of mind being part of being human and so on and so forth, and actually autistic people lack a theory of mind, which then leads you to think, well, does that mean we're seen as less than human? Um, and some of the rhetoric, for example, at the origins of ABA, there is, it's clearly, you know, it, it's there in the written narrative that this is by all, it, to all intents and purposes, a person, but it isn't really. It might have eyes, ears, mouth, but it's not, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now we're going back decades, so it's not fair to judge by today's standards, if you like, but, and again, a rhetorical question, um, and I know the answer to this, if you investigate current as in today's training for certain clinicians, they are still being taught to be autistic is to lack a theory of mind. And I'm right, aren't that is that is literally what is being taught. So we are still being told this is part and parcel of being autistic, as opposed to, um, well, if you're gonna say that autistic people lack a theory of mind, what you actually mean is the PNT lack an autistic theory of mind, just as much, if not more so. And that, that is, I can't prove it, um, but I can, if, if if that wasn't the case, then I wouldn't exist, not in an existential way, but my, I wouldn't need to teach people about autism because they would already automatically know it and they don't. Um, I think we've got to reject this notion of being lesser. And again, I don't want to harp on about diagnostic criteria, but current diagnostic criteria state you have to be lesser. You have to have a deficit against a perceived norm. You have to, in order to get that identification. And also you're not allowed to be autistic until you are formally identified by a clinician. You're not allowed to go, I've just realized I'm autistic and everybody goes, okay, cool. I don't know why we need other people to tell us who we are, um, but apparently we do. And some of those people are amazing, but I still wonder about the validity of not being allowed to tell other people who you are without that medicalized label. That worries me as well. Um, okay. Uh, just a little bit uh, thing about uh, monotropism. So some of you will know about this theory of monotropism. Um, the first, as far as we know, autistic-led um, kind of theory of autism. One of the more popular theories of autism within the autistic community, one which more autistic people feel that they will align to compared to some of the other um, sort of popular, if you like, um, psychological theories like central coherence theory of mind, executive functioning, those sorts of things. One of the things that I did want to say about monotropism though, um, is this whole thing about processing speeds and again understanding life through the autism lens because that's what it's all about and then all of a sudden you are seen as a completely different person um, and I know that other people have really good ways of articulating processing speeds and we're told sometimes oh you're very slow at processing you're very slow at processing language you're very slow at picking up on cues you're very slow at this I think the opposite is actually the case this is possibly maybe the most emotive, one of the most important things to me, I would say, and possibly to you, you don't have to share, but I think having the, I, I still see it as one of the most precious things in the world, being able to trust in something or someone. And it's so rare. Um, in terms of feeling safe, knowing you're with somebody who is not going to harm you ever or, or, or you know but what I would yeah it, I just don't think it occurs very much you know even people who purport to be trustworthy within a working environment or whatever it might be suddenly turn out and that's not the just case I wrote a book a few months ago but it's not out yet it's called uh, what works for autistic children um, and I've got to write another one next year called What Works for Autistic Adults. But it's, and, and in it, I'd, and it might seem fanciful, but I said, look, in, in education, we need to be teaching autistry, which is autism history. You know, that should be part and parcel of the curriculum. We should be teaching the neurodiversity paradigm as general, that's, that's a, as an academic subject or part of anthropology or whatever, from primary school all the way through. So it becomes completely normalised. And by doing that, and we, we teach things proactively, like 
How do you know whether to trust somebody? What does trust actually mean? What does lying actually mean? Saying to somebody that, I don't know, uh, the French for a table is la table, or is it? Is it la table? And actually getting it wrong doesn't mean that thereafter you are wrong in everything that you say. People can make mistakes and there's a, there's a, there's a, a scale of mistakes. There's a scale of malicious intent. And combining those two together in an algorithm will allow you then to come out to the other end in terms of my conclusion, in terms of you did screw up, but you're still okay. Or you did screw up and you're not okay. And in terms of vulnerability, until we're taught how to do that in an objective way, we are still going to be vulnerable. And again, I don't see it on a day-to-day -day basis with children or with adults. I, I Honestly, it goes back to what you were saying in terms of you're just kind of left to fend for yourself. I think. Um, sense of self, one of the most amazing things as an autistic person I think you are ever going to be allowed is to be yourself. Simple as that. And I'll finish off with that as a quotation. Um, I'm just well aware of, yeah. Um, demographical status, so I talked about the predominant neurotype. If you take a demographical norm in terms of um, statistics, there are more um, non-autistic people, non neurodivergent individuals um, and it is neurodivergent not neurodiverse the world is neurodiverse people are neurodivergent quickly just yeah anyway, I'm sure you all know that um, but in terms of the numbers being against us if you're in a minority group there's a higher risk of being discriminated against simple as that being autistic is being in a minority group and actually and I do mean I, I'm, I'm sort of rushing a bit because I'm aware of the time but um, if the world caters for most people, if you're not most people, the world is not catering for you. And I think, in a sense, it's as simple as that. That doesn't mean to say we can't do something about it, but it does mean that you are at greater risk of being unsafe just by virtue of the fact that you're in a minority group. And then um, my thoughts in terms of proactive reasoning, and I've put a loop in way of doing things. I, I developed this with somebody I was doing a lot of very individual work with. and. I'm not saying you have to do this. I'm not an interventionist. I'm not a therapist. I'm not a counsellor. I'm not anything um, like that. And then, um, uh, Alyssa, uh, uh, you can read. Well, no, I ought to read it just in case because it is quite. The privilege of being oneself is a gift many take for granted, but for someone with autism, being allowed to be oneself is the greatest and rarest gift of all. Best quotation of all time. And you've got two and a half minutes for questions. Uh, so how do you go about investigating your own sense of profile? Brilliant question. Um, if you, uh, th there are loads of, um, well not loads, there are plenty of sensory tools out there that you can find, um, including there's one you can access for free on my blog actually, which is just questions that you might ask yourself around the sensory environment. Occupa if you want to go down a more sort of professional clinical route, occupational therapists are quite often quite good at um, understanding. Um, there's I don't want to go about my own books, but I've got chapters in books as well, which are just predominantly around um, the sensory environment and what might or might not impact you as an autistic person. There's loads of sensory checklists online as well that might make you think, oh, that's interesting. I remember um, going back in the day, PJ, you, you remember from Sheffield, he'd come to a talk that, with me about sensory and he just stood there, he was having a fag going, oh, all this sensory stuff, it's quite interesting, but nothing to do with me. And I said, oh, PJ, do you find the uh, touch of your t-shirt against your skin like really irritating? He's like, yeah, I can't bear it oh do you think that's sensory and it's really interesting that you know and I've had 70 year olds going through the same similar experience going I just had no idea literally had no idea it can be so illuminating absolutely there's loads of stuff online in terms of the sensory and then and amazing books as well Olga Bogdashin is obviously one of the key authors in terms of sensory stuff um, more recent stuff around sensory modulation as well about how to modulate your sensory environment in terms of self absolutely it's particularly around um vestibular you know movement bouncing about and so on so yeah there's there's loads of stuff and absolutely do do it 100 percent recommend it so we've got the room i know some people now have to leave because the post diagnostic support group is 12 till 2. so if you need to leave well, done, thank you for coming all right of course it was thank usual But I think we've got the room for a bit longer. So if you want to leave now, please do so. This is the time it's meant to end. Um, but Evie and Chloe, I think we've got the room for a bit longer. Yeah, okay. 
So I'm just conscious of the people who didn't get the whole presentation on um, from Zoom and stuff. Are there questions, are there things that they would like to ask now that we could elaborate on? Nothing at the moment. Okay. What about in the room? This is some people's first post-diagnostic support group, isn't it? So I don't recognise some people here. Uh -huh. Yes. Yes. I mean, Luke presents at an amazing speed. And um, we're very privileged. He's never done that presentation before and he won't do it anywhere else. So when it goes on the website... Sorry, I'm going to get off a sec now. So I'm just so pleased that Luke felt safe enough to share that with us. Um, and so again, I'd remind people of confidentiality. That is not going to be repeated anywhere else. We are extremely privileged. And as he just said, he's going to be going to the United Nations and the World Health Organization in a few months' time. So, you know, little old Axia, really, what a privilege. So I want to answer your question, we do have resources on our website. A lot of the resources that Luke just referred to around sensory, Jackie, Jackie Brett, our occupational therapist, has got a wealth of resources. We're trying to improve our resources on the website. And um, for example, we've recently been joined by Katrina Stewart, Dr. Stewart OBE, who is um, an expert on women and girls and is adding some more resources to that. So we just keep trying to update and change um, which are Axia and O can drive the people who work for us absolutely nuts because just when they think they've understood where we're at we move the thing again for the very reasons you're talking about that we just need to keep updated so I think you'll find a lot of the resources he referred to on our website I would suggest you read his books I think we've bought his books here so you can borrow them or you could take a photo order them on Amazon. His new book will be out soon and we're also privileged we get pre we get copies in advance of them being available. So some of those are just ideas. Um, things like monotropism, that goes way back to um, a woman called Donna Williams, who some of you may have heard of, an autistic woman who was writing about monotropism back in the 80s. So some of these are not new ideas. Some of them have been lost along the way, and Luke's sort of bringing some of those back. The whole theory of mind, there's quite a lot on our website about that. As you know at Axia, we don't talk about lack of theory of mind. We talk about theory of mind and then try and explain how that is a difficulty for autistic people understanding neurotypical people, but also vice versa. So I, I hope that's a bit of an answer, not a complete answer, I know that. It would be good if he had this journal article, that journal article, but a lot of what he's talking about isn't out there in the academic literature. But there will be things on our resource library which we're in the business of updating as we speak. Okay, for the people who are on Zoom, that was Autopia that Luke referred to. There is a presentation on our website about Autopia. Um, we do record all of our presentations. Luke's spoken to us before. The other person that you might want to look at is Sarah Hendricks, who um, has done a lot of presentations for us before. So all of our presentations are recorded. Have a look. You don't have to look at them all. Um, I'm going to be doing one on alexithymia. Um, when am I doing that? Next time, September. Um, so I'm going to blow open the whole concept of alexithymia and give you the history about where it came from and why I think it's an awful term. So Luke's again referred a bit to that. But if you said to me, Linda, what journal articles are you basing that on? Absolutely none. Um, well, that's not actually true. I'm basing it on some of the history, but I'm basing it on what I've learned from doing the job that I do and thinking about that. I, I think you also asked the question uh, about is it up to the autistic community in a way to make safety? What I would say about this group, this group is safe. And if I detect anything that isn't safe, there'll be big trouble. So you can come here either virtually or physically. And I hope people that I know quite well in the room, I hope you would say you've always felt, thank you, you've always felt safe being here. Um, 
absolutely critical. To say that people don't feel safe is just waking up every morning not knowing if you're going to be safe. That's just horrendous. So Axia strives. We don't always get it right. We do strive to make people feel safe. We do ask at the beginning, do you want to be contacted by email, you know, text? We probably need to get better at that, but it's actually... We're asking a lot of a small group of employees trying to push Axia through and keep us stable, moving to our new premises, trying to do things like this. So we ask a lot of our staff. So we can get better and we will get better, but that again will mean change at Axia. And if people want to feed into that about their experiences of Axia, sorry, I've gone dyspraxic, um, their experiences of Axia. So if there are things you liked, tell us. If there are things you think we could get better on, tell us. We really want to change and make it as safe as possible. But I believe this group is safe. I hope people feel a bit... New people, I, I can see why would you trust us, but come back again in September and we'll talk about alexithymia from the Greek. Which those of you who know me know my passion is Greece and Greek holidays and so those of you who couldn't hear that, Sarah was talking about a, a concept of neurogenesis. So it's N-E-U-R-O-G-E-N-E-S-I-S. -E 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 again, two Greek words. Um, very simple Greek words. But as, again, about, you know, as a way of overcoming trauma. I also think there's the thing that he was saying about rumination. So the fact that I fell over there and nearly fell into the radiator... Um, I'm not going to go out of here and think I looked a complete pillock in front of that group of people because I know this is a safe place and that if any of you think I looked a complete pillock, that's your problem, not mine. So I think there's something about that not doing that rumination. So I do not want any of you going home from here thinking um, I shouldn't have done that or I shouldn't have said that. Whatever you've done or not done is absolutely fine. Does that make sense? Okay, now I know people who are joining us via Zoom, it's different because you're in hopefully a safe place and uh, you can relax in that safe place. But just to reassure you, if you do come to the group, it will be safe. Do we have any questions from the people in... I'm looking at Chloe and Evie. Yeah. Uh, how to stay safe in healthcare systems. Well, I think for any of us, going to any healthcare setting is, I think going on your own is incredibly difficult. And I don't think that you remember very much of what is said to you when you go on your own. And so I suppose the safety you could take with you would be somebody you trust who could take that safety with you to the healthcare settings. You can, the National Autistic Society, it's, some people might find it a bit patronising, but you could draw up a healthcare passport that you could actually give to the healthcare professional. So it, it, or you could draw up your own, where you might want to say, this is the way to communicate with me. This is my um, neurodiversity. This is what it means. By the way, we do have our new alert cards here for people that were diagnosed a while ago, you might want one of our new cards because, again, we've improved on our autism, dyspraxia and ADHD alert cards. Please go and get those. And people at Zoom, if you would like those, um, we can deal with that through our inquiries email. We can get them sent out to you, providing you've been diagnosed by us. So now I've gone off a dyspraxic tangent and I've no idea what the question was. Healthcare. 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 Thank you. So I suppose it's about taking someone who can help you um, and not going on your own. So I personally would probably not do very well going on my own. Um, so Bev is my PA and I'm not very good about phoning up my GP and uh, Bev would be doing things like that for me, reminding me of the time, reminding me what I'm going for giving me an information pack that I need to take. So if you can get a PA, <laughs> Bev, you're going nowhere. You're not doing anyone else's. So Bev is mine and Calvin's PA, and that is the only way we can function in the jobs we're doing. Without that, 
we aren't functioning. So if you can find an equivalent um, that will do it for free, Bev obviously doesn't do it for free, um, <laughs> then I think that's a really good idea. But just think about who do you trust, who can make it as safe as possible. Evie, Chloe, anything more from our friends in the Zoom? I think, I think there's a process in when you receive the diagnosis and adjusting to the diagnosis, and we send out the transition curve with the diagnosis. And I'd ask people to look at that because you, some people leave and they're seemingly overjoyed at the diagnosis, and we try and congratulate people where appropriate on receiving a diagnosis. But sometimes they'll go away and then go, no, that was wrong. They have it that, that I've told them things that they just wanted to hear and that's, you know, I'm an imposter. So if you look at the transition curve, it can go from shock, denial to hitting the rock bottom. So I suppose I'd ask that person, first of all, to think about where they're at in the transition curve, where other people around them are at in the transition curve. So you might come out of it really understanding it, really integrating meaning into it, but the person you came with is going, and I, I don't believe it. So then you've immediately got a conflict. You've got a conflict with the people around you who are in a different place from you. I think it takes time. And if you're diagnosed later in life, sometimes it takes a lot longer. Not always. And sometimes for children it can be a process that happens later on, if they're diagnosed when they're five or six, then when they get to 14, 15, 16, there's often a questioning then, because they don't necessarily remember what happened when they were five or six, which is why we try and, uh, Axia, what we try and do is try and send a message to that little child through maybe our personal letters to say, we do remember you and we did give you a book or we remember you were really interested in Minecraft, for example, and or you're really good at Lego. So there's a bit of a message there to that child. So when they get older, they can have some vague memory of what the diagnosis was. They won't remember the words necessarily, but they might remember the feeling. And that's what we know from all the research literature that people don't necessarily, so going back to healthcare settings, you don't necessarily remember the words, but what you do remember is the way those words were given. And if they're given with empathy, um, you will remember that, even if you don't necessarily remember the words. So empathy is something as well that we have got resources on something I feel very passionate about, because I don't think the neurotypical population are empathic at all. And if you actually look for empathy, um, you very rarely see it, very rarely. You might see a bit of sympathy, you might see pretend sympathy, but you don't see empathy. Sadly lacking. I think I, I, my experience of autistic people is they are in some ways more empathic God, I'm going off on one. I'm delivering another bloody presentation here. Oh, then I'll, start, I'll just do this bit about empathy because it's one of my special interests. I, autistic people, I think, absorb the, f the emotions and the feelings. Uh, they can walk into a room and know there's something going on, but they have no idea necessarily who it is or what to do with it. So they absorb those feelings, and those feelings almost become their own. And they become overwhelming because they don't know what to do with them. Because empathy is actually a process that you uh, try and tell what somebody else is thinking or feeling, you convey that back to them. They then let you know whether that's accurate. You then do the next phase. And, but it's a phasic model, it's a process. Now, if you've got an autistic person who's just absorbed it and then doesn't know what to do with it, they walk away with those feelings. In, inside themselves, and I think that's very overwhelming. I don't know if any of the autistic people, you don't have to answer, but if any of the autistic people in the room have ever experienced. If, for those of you at Zoom, we would, um, Sarah very kindly shared her own experiences of, of that experience, and I'm sure there are other people in the room who've experienced it as well. I've been talking too long. Um, any final questions from people in Zoom? I'm so sorry that it didn't work out as brilliantly as we would like. Please bear with us. 
again, don't want anyone from Axia going home worried that they haven't done anything perfectly because we've done our best. So there's no rumination from anyone. Um, we did our best and we'll continue to improve. So next time it's me, what is the date of the next one? The 9th of November. The 9th of November, that's two days after my birthday. Okay, so I hope as many of you as possible can come to the race course. Um, I, I think it's a reasonably okay environment. Do people, yeah, lots of nods in the room. So some people are saying lovely. So those of you who are maybe frightened to come, but could come, please come in November. And, and people will be wearing Axia t-shirts with our names on and the logo. And uh, so you will be welcomed. So thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you.